Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. We've got some mind-numbing information for you tonight. Pick up where we did left off last week. Did any of you go home and, and actually research this by any chance or do any studying, any reading? Did you? Really? That's one. One out of the whole group. Two. Two. Two out of the three. I didn't recognize your hair looked different. Three out of the whole. There we go. Getting more hands. Um, this, this turned out to be a lot longer than what I intended it to be because the more I studied it, the more interested I got into it and the more information I found and the more I'm going to give you. Uh, so uh, we may not even finish this year. We might actually finish this next year, but we'll go through it as, as much as we possibly can. Hey, I have a microphone now. That's good. That's good. I want to give you a history lesson um, before we, we get too deep into this tonight. Now, I know I left you hanging with a question. Anybody remember what the question was? Why did they choose the name Israel when they moved back into their homeland in 1948 instead of the name Judah? And we will get to that. Before I do that, I want to give you a history lesson. Um, give us the next page there. Well, that's actually our scripture. Give me the next one. We'll get to that. If you look at this, on the top of that, I show you the world empires through the Old Testament age into up to the time of Christ. Uh, the first real uh, known empire was that of Egypt. Uh, and then came Assyria from 810 to 612 B.C. Uh, Babylon from 609 to uh, 539. Medio persia 539 to 334. And then Rome came in there a couple hundred years later, 197 uh, to 636 A.D. Now, I gave you that line so that you can better understand where some of these other things took place. 1462 B.C. was approximately the time that Israel went into the Promised Land. You remember, they left Egypt, uh, Pharaoh let them go, uh, they spent a uh, you know, generation of time in the wilderness uh, at the edge of the Promised Land, crossed over and then conquered the Promised Land. They moved in about 1462 B.C., which you can see was, was way back here in history. Okay? After they moved into the Promised Land, they were an organized kingdom. We talked about that last week. You know, they, all of the 12 tribes of Israel were all organized in, in, the, in the Promised Land. In 922 B.C., which you'll see that's prior to the time of that Assyrian Empire. In 922 B.C., the kingdom divided. And we talked about that last week, how the northern kingdom of Israel said, became the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And the northern kingdom of Israel didn't want to follow the king that was in the lineage of David. They chose their own king. And because of that, then God eventually uh, removed them from his sight which was the Assyrian captivity. 721 B.C. is when that northern kingdom was taken captivity by that Assyrian empire that was reigning over the world in that day. Okay, the faithful remnant then was that of Judah. Uh, the tribes of Benjamin and Judah, some of the tribe of Simeon, and a few of those who uh, were, were faithful trickled down into that area of Judah, and they became the remnant. They became the remnant of God's people. Those from the northern kingdom were dispersed and actually uh, lost their identity as, as Jewish people. They later were, were assumed to be the Samaritans of Jesus' day. You know how the Jews hated the Samaritans and they didn't get along. Um, but they were taken captive by the Assyrians. Later on, the southern kingdom of Judah also became rebellious to God, and God gave them over to the Babylonians, the Babylonian captivity, and they were carried off into captivity. Okay, that meant that there were no 
Jew. I mean, there were Jews in the world, but they had lost their 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 land. They had lost their identity. They lost control over themselves. Um, in 197 BC, that Rome rose to power. Now you notice there's some time here. Uh, for instance, let me back up. The Medio Persian Empire was when. Uh, the the emperor of, of that empire allowed the Jewish people to move back into the homeland to rebuild the wall. You remember under Nehemiah, they rebuilt the wall, rebuilt the city. Ezra and Nehemiah in there rebuilt the city of Jerusalem, rebuilt the wall, rebuilt the temple in those days. And then, so they had, had kind of gathered back to their homeland, and then Rome took over in 197. Um, and so that that's kind of a, an outline of the things we talked about last week in kind of a, a so you can kind of see in history where all of this happened and then along comes the birth of Jesus at the changing of time with the conception of the birth of Jesus Christ came a change of time for the world have you ever wondered why the calculation of the ages was changed from BC to AD uh, the abbreviation A.D. stands for Annus Domini, meaning the year of our Lord. The Julian calendar was instituted by Julius Caesar during his reign using the conception or birth of Christ as the focal point for history. There's no year zero in the calendar. It, 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 it goes from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D., Something that I found that was interesting is that the conception of Christ is actually believed to have been four or five years prior to the transition in the Julian calendar. So it's, it's quite possible that Christ was born in 4 B.C. Okay? Jesus was crucified at 33 years of age, putting his crucifixion anywhere from 28 to 33 A.D. A generation is somewhere around 30 years in the scriptures. And so approximately one generation after the time of Christ, Rome took aim at the remnant of Jewish people that were living now in the promised land. Now you have to remember, the Jews rejected Jesus and called for his crucifixion. When Jesus was crucified, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. It was broken from top to bottom, uh, that veil that separated the holy of holies from the outside world. It was split because Jesus, the true high priest, had entered by his own blood to atone for the sins of mankind once and for all. And having done so, he opened his salvation to all men so that Jew and Gentile could be saved. Now, I'm, I'm giving you a lot of information here, but you, you, I want you to understand this concept of what's taking place, Okay. The Jews, the northern kingdom, first of all, says we want nothing to do with David. They separated themselves, and God removed them from his sight, leaving the remnant in Judah. Judah are those who are now occupying the, the homeland. They, move on to the next map here. Let me, let, maybe it'll show it to you a little bit. Here was, here was how they were separated, Okay. And once the northern kingdom was taken into captivity, then show the next map. Here's what was left. Okay. That was what was left of God's chosen people. That's where the remnant was. And so with these people, in the time of Christ, it was this, this remnant of Jews that was in the promised land. There were the people that shouted, crucify them. The Jews that Jesus came to redeem rejected him, but it was all part of God's plan because when they rejected him, God opened salvation to the entire world. God did it. He allowed this to happen on purpose so that everyone could be saved. When Jesus died on the cross, what he did was totally fulfill the Jewish sacrificial system. What they practiced for all of those years through the wilderness and in the temple he had completely fulfilled on the cross. That's why the veil of the temple was then opened. That veil that separated the holiest place from the rest was opened so that not just the high priest could go in, 
But now, since the real high priest, Jesus himself, had entered by his own blood, he opened that veil so that everyone could go in. So the salvation was open to the world. Now, Rome occupied the area of Judea after the time of Christ. In about, in, in the Jewish people rebelled against that Roman Empire. There were, there were actually two major revolts against Rome and Jerusalem. And if you get the opportunity, you need to read Josephus' account of these events. Uh, I read just yesterday Josephus' account of how the temple was destroyed, and it was, it's amazing detail. The first revolt of the Jewish people against that empire of Rome was 66 to 73 AD with Emperor Vespasian and Titus. The second temple was completely destroyed after the first revolt in 70 AD. It was destroyed by Titus, General Titus. The trees were cut down and the land was salted in 71 AD so that nothing would grow. In 66 AD, the Romans robbed the temple treasury and the Jews revolted for three and a half years. The first revolt ended three and a half years later in 73 when the fortress of Masada was destroyed by the Romans. Do you, have you ever seen a picture of the Masada? It was like the top of this with nothing but cliffs on the side. And, 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 and there was 900 Jewish people that lived in that. Rome sent 10,000 soldiers to build a ramp, and, and, they, and at the peril of their own lives, they were being slaughtered as they're building this ramp so that they could wipe out these 900 rebellious Jews that were remaining. That's how bad Rome wanted to annihilate the Jews. But instead of allowing those Roman soldiers to kill them, they committed suicide rather than be captured. Each man killed his family, and then one killed the rest before killing himself. The Kedos War in 115 to 117 under Emperor Trajan, uh, hundreds of thousands were killed in Jewish communities uh, of Cyprus and Cyrene, which is now Libya, uh, Egypt and Mesopotamia, which is Syria and Iraq. Pagan temples in the tomb of Pompeii were also destroyed. There was the Bar Kochba revolt of 132 to 135 A.D. The city of Jerusalem was destroyed after the second major, re the second major revolt. And then at that time, between 132 and 135 A.D., the people were exiled. The re remnant, the remainder of these Jewish people were exiled. Judea was renamed Palestine, and the land was completely plowed under. In other words, what we have known throughout the entire Old Testament time, up through the time of Christ, is now totally obliterated. There is no longer an Israel. There is no longer a homeland. The people are dispersed throughout the known earth. But you have to remember this. Romans chapter 11. If you have your Bible, take it out. You can read along with me. Romans chapter 11. We're going to start at the very first verse. He says, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means, I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he, he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel? He said, Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I'm only the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? God answered, I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Very important words. There is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then, what the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain, the salvation of God. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Okay, here's where we are. 
Did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I'm talking to you Gentiles, he says. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and the sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. And if you do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you are cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? God's trying to explain this plan of salvation to people like you and me. We're not Jewish people, but we are saved through Christ because the Jewish people rejected him. But we shouldn't become arrogant that we are saved because they're part of the natural branch. We didn't belong, and God grafted us in. He goes on in verse 25 to say, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters. So that you may not be conceited, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Until all of those that God has foreknown will be saved can come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Remember that. God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. So why the name Israel? Why the name Israel? Why when the Jews moved back into the homeland in 1948, did they not call their land Judah? Why did they insist on calling themselves Israel? Who as a nation did they identify themselves with? The rebels who God removed from his side or the faithful who God who carried God's blessing? Habakkuk 3 verses 17 and 18 says this, Though the fig tree does not bud, And there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there were no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Do you know that there are 40 references to the fig tree in the Bible? There's one specifically that I want to bring us to tonight. It's in in two passages of scripture that I initially want to look at. First is in Matthew chapter 21. It says, Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Now you've got to keep in mind that the fig tree would bear figs 
and then it would bear leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again, and immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? Jesus said, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but you also can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. I can't tell you how many times that verse is misquoted. Because it's taken out of the context of the scripture that Jesus gave it in. The other passage is in Mark chapter 11. It says, The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in, in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Now the next few verses here is going to go into a side story that's going to teach the lesson. Verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts. Now remember, he's going into the church. And he began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? With that, the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this, and they began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Okay, this is the set up. Now it's set up. Jesus is teaching his disciples using the fig tree. The fig tree represents Israel. He went to the fig tree trying to find fruit, trying to bear the fruit that God was looking for when he sent Christ into the world. But there was absolutely nothing on it because they rejected him. And Jesus said to the fig tree, that's it, you're done. And instantly it withered. But to show this to his disciples, he took them into the temple with him and showed them what they had done to the church. What they had done to God's plan. Then he goes back to the fig tree. Verse 19, when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. This dead from the ground up. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And Jesus said, have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for for in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. He's still teaching them. There's one more passage, and it's in Luke chapter 13, that represents the same story that Jesus just showed by example to his disciples. He says in verse 6, Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all of the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. How long was Jesus' ministry? He said, cut it down. Why should, I use up, why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, 
How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. And listen to this. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All right. The Old Testament law has been fulfilled through Christ at the crucifixion. The veil of the temple is rent open so that Jew and Gentile can be saved. Part of God's plan. God loves everybody, so God wants to save the whole world, not just the Jews. The Jews rejected Christ. He came to them first. They rejected him. And because of that, he said, your house is left to you desolate. You're done. It's over. It's left to you desolate. And you're not going to see me again. You're not going to acknowledge me. You're you're not going to hear from me until you say these words. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The fig tree withered from the root. Withering was a symbol of imminent death. When Jesus cursed the fig tree for not having any fruit, he wasn't using profanity because he was disgusted that he couldn't find something to eat. But he was pronouncing judgment because the tree wasn't doing what he created it to do. And in this blasting of this fruitless fig tree, the Son of God was suggesting this. Number one, the nation of Israel, as a political entity, had become a worthless mechanism in the sacred scheme of things. Because of this, it was worthy of nothing but destruction. Number two, that destruction would shortly come within 40 years of the time of Christ with the invasion of the land by the Roman armies. Number three, the punishment would be complete and final. The tree would be dead from the very roots. Dead is dead. The fig tree didn't just wither and go into some dormant state, but it died from the roots upward. There was no longer any life in it. It was now useless to no one. Getting the picture of what's going on with Israel. Why am I telling you this? There are a lot of people who have glorified, even deified, the present nation of Israel. They're convinced that we should support them and honor them in whatever they do, even though they don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. I want to again point out to you that Israel, by name, never returned from bondage. Israel swore an oath to remove themselves from the lineage of David and the genealogy that produced Jesus. God removed Israel from his sight. Israel today is no more godly than the Muslim nations that surround it. Israel was not spiritual but made a mockery of God in the temple and the faith that God had instilled in them. Israel was responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But because of their rejection of Jesus as the Messiah, salvation has come to all men. And now because Israel rejected God, all who like Abraham, acknowledge God and submit to his authority and reject idolatry are God's chosen people. We are Judah. Okay? Now turn to Romans chapter 10. Verse 1. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says... Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. 
It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and you are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We are Judah. So is Israel important or not then? This doesn't diminish the fact that the nation that bears the name Israel is still at the epicenter of history, past, present, and future. Because those who are still fighting uh, Old Testament battles still consider Israel to be their natural-born enemy. That's why we must watch Israel. Not just the church. Always keep your eye on God's church. But we must also watch the nation that bears the name Israel. We must watch the fig tree. The withered, dead fig tree. The fig tree is the only tree in Palestine that loses its leaves in the progression of the calendar year. In the summer, it's conspicuous because of its leaf buds. It's a seasonal barometer. When it shows green, the hot season's on the way. It's regarded in Palestine as the herald of the summer season, for when the fig tree begins to bud with life, everyone in the land knows that summer is at hand. It is a ticking time bomb, vulnerable and unstable, and one false move, one random hit, one action in the wrong place will begin a sequence of events that will instigate the return of Christ and the end of the world. The United Nations don't know what it's trying to handle. The Arab nations don't know what beehive they are disturbing. The Palestinian terrorist groups don't understand what kind of a monster they're picking on. Those who are anti-Jew and anti-Christian have no inkling as to whose side they're lining up on. Even many in the church have no idea, but the fig tree is changing. The fig tree is coming into a new season. The only one who's remotely aware is Satan. When God prophesied through Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37 concerning the nation of Israel, as he first prophesied, there was a shaking and the dead bones came together. And they were covered with sinews and flesh and they stood on their feet an exceeding great army. These were dead bones. You remember the story. He said to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, he said, look at these bones. And he, he said, what do you see? He said, I see dead bones and they're bleached out and they're scattered. And God said, can they live? And, well, he didn't want to, he didn't want to try to outthink God. He said, well, you know. He knew it was a trick question. These were dead bones, scattered bones, disorganized, lifeless, and without hope. That's about where they are. But God put them back together again. Unlike Humpty Dumpty, when all of the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put them back together again, God stepped in and did what nobody thought could be done with the Jewish people and with their homeland. But God said, Ezekiel prophesy again. And when he did, as God said, the four winds breathed into this standing army the breath of life. In 1948, the dead scattered bones of Israel were reassembled and organized into a great standing army. And I'm convinced that the time is at hand when the Holy Spirit of God is going to breathe into them the breath of life. Soon, even the Jews are going to become real Yehuda. 
And they're going to recognize Jesus as a Messiah. It might take a world war for it to happen. It may take every enemy nation to pounce on them at once. But whatever it is that brings them to their breaking point, there will come a day when they will fall to their knees and call on Jesus Christ. And as he promised, they will then see him again. I was telling some people last Wednesday night, I said, if I was a movie maker, I would make a movie. I said, no, I don't know if this is scriptural. Don't know if this is the way it's going to happen. I just think it would be really cool. If the nation of Israel falls under attack, all of these Arab nations decide they're going to wipe them out, and all together they join forces and they come right after Israel. And when Israel is, is under the greatest attack, their people fall to their knees and they cry out to Jesus, the Messiah. Suddenly, the Ark of the Covenant appears. There would be Arabs killing themselves to get out of the way. That'd be really cool. Now, I don't know if that's scripture or not, but wouldn't that be really cool? Watch the fig tree. Watch the fig tree. You say, it's just a small tree. I mean, it's an insignificant tree. It might be small, but it's not insignificant. The entire land mass of the nation of Israel is 7,978 square miles. To put that in perspective, the state of New Jersey is 7,836 square miles. Now, I know of no one who feels threatened by New Jersey. I know no one who is asking New Jersey to give up more of its property to keep peace with its neighbors. I know of nobody who feels like New Jersey must be kept under control to save the rest of the world. There aren't anti-New Jersey groups and anti-New Jersey marches. So why Israel? Why Israel? The population of the nation of Israel is 5.5 million people. That's 626 people per square mile. How many did Hitler kill in the Holocaust? Six million. More than are there right now. 83% of Israel's population are Jews. The other 17% are Arabs. More than half of the Jewish population are Israeli-born. But the amazing fact is that their immediate forebears came from more than 100 different countries and spoke 85 different languages or major dialects. Talk about Ezekiel's prophecy. The bones that were scattered have come together. The scattered bones, the disorganized bones, the lifeless bones have come together. They're unified, they're solidified, they're organized, and they're structured. They just don't have any life. Now, they're still convinced that they're going to get it through the temple, that someday that they're going to rebuild that temple and they're going to reinstitute the sacrifices and they're going to do all of that. But God isn't going to let that happen because Jesus already wiped that out. That's over with. He fulfilled it. The nation that surround Israel still view them as they did in Old Testament times. The Muslim nations around Israel don't have the Bible education that we're privileged to have. They don't recognize Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, and they too, like Israel, are still waiting for Israel's Messiah. They're still waiting on, his, on their king. They still fear him, and because of their history, they still have a fear of the Jews. That's why none of those nations have attacked Israel, but they gladly support and supply for another nation to do it. We're not going to attack them, but we will give you some bombs if you go ahead and do it for us. It's the same reason why the Arab nations allowed the United States to use their airfields and their land to attack Saddam Hussein. You see, Saddam Hussein believed himself to be Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem three times. He was Saddam Hussein's hero. He would have Babylonian Renaissance festivals in his country where he would have banners that had a, the head of Nebuchadnezzar and his own, Saddam Hussein's head, right next to it. The Muslim nations around Saddam Hussein feared that he might do what his hero did in the past and set off a chain of events that would mean the end of their world. That's why we were allowed to go get him. Because even though those nations want Israel to be destroyed, they're afraid of what's going to happen if it gets started. Because they still live in these Old Testament times. Israel's come together. They're organized, a standing army, but they still have no lie because they still reject Jesus as their Messiah. Now, what does this mean? It means that Satan's time is limited. It means that his opportunity to steal, kill, and destroy is coming to an end, and the time of his judgment is at hand. 
Satan knows that Israel is the measuring stick by which his destiny is determined. That's why he's tried to hinder and even destroy it. It's much like a doctor doing a blood test on you and telling you that if a certain chemical in your body reaches a specific level, you're going to die. Knowing that, you're going to try everything in your power to keep that chemical from reaching that level. That's exactly what Satan's been trying to do throughout history. He knew that it was through the people of Israel that God would send the Messiah. So what did he do? He tried to destroy the Jewish race. He came very close. In the book of Esther, if it weren't for the intervention of God, Haman would have done just that. Throughout history, Satan has used the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. He shipped them into the, to be humiliated and murdered in German gas chambers, but he has never, ever been able to completely annihilate them. They just keep coming back. No matter what he does, they keep coming back. He persecutes them, but they keep coming back. He enslaves them, but they keep coming back. He murders them, but they keep coming back. And Satan now sees the standing army, and he fears that his judgment is very near. On May the 14th, 1948, an independent nation of Israel was declared. And on the very next day, within 24 hours, on May the 15th, 1948, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Palestine attacked this new nation. What are the odds? What are the odds? Less than 24 hours old, Israel was already in its first war. The nation of Israel has been in constant battles ever since. There was the Six-Day War of 1967, which uh, Israel attacked Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and simultaneously won decisively. When it, you know, it's like the little kid in the neighborhood, and you got all these big bullies, but there is record of this little dude whipping up on these guys. Now, they all want to hurt him, but they're afraid of him. Okay? In 1973 was the Yom Kippur War. It's been called by some historians the earthquake. Remember the shaking of Ezekiel's prophecy? On October 6, 1973, Israel's holiest fast day, Egypt and Syria, financed by Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and supplied by the USSR military equipment, attacked Israel. In the early 1900s came the Persian Gulf War, where Scud missiles were dropped in Israel, wounding 200 people and damaging over 9,000 homes in Tel Aviv area. We see yearly in the news how a suicide bomber kills people at a Passover feast. There was a season when one suicide bomber per day killed himself trying to kill the Jewish people. Nearly one-fifth of Israel's population is in the military. In the 1990s, 176,000 served in Israel's army, another 436,000 in their reserves. There are 32,000 in their air force, which is supplied by nearly 600 of the best Israeli-built planes. They even have 10,000 in their navy. All men and women at age 18 are automatically enrolled in the military. The women serve just two years while the men serve three, but upon discharge they remain in reserves until age 55, serving one to two months a year in military service. How would you like to live like that? Is Israel always right? No. Even in biblical records, they were constantly making wrong decisions and bad choices, but they always paid the consequences. In the book of Judges, there was a steady pattern. They had seven apostasies where they turned their backs on God, seven servitudes to foreign nations because of their sin, and seven times they cried out for God to help, and seven times God raised up a deliverer or a judge to set them free. And seven times, once they had tasted freedom again, they returned to their wicked ways to start the cycle all over. I'm not here to, t- to defend Israel. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not here to tell you that every political move and every military move is justified. Now, some people do that. Well, Israel did it, so it's good. Y- it's not always that way. Not every Palestinian who's killed by an Israeli soldier is killed in self-defense. Not every decision that their leaders make is a godly decision. Not every action is by divine instruction. But I am telling you to watch the fig tree. Who are its enemies and why are they its enemies what force unifies those who oppose israel and wants to see it destroyed why is it the time this tiny nation the focal point of every newscast the front page of every newspaper and the main topic of discussion when our own military is warring somewhere else in the world in the early 1990s at the beginning of the persian gulf war when iraqi bombs were first being dropped in the tel aviv area something inside of me lit up i remember we had church that night. It was a Wednesday. And P. 
pe- we had a better crowd that night for some reason. You know, when bombs started falling in Tel Aviv, more people showed up for church. But a nerve in me that had never been activated came to life. Prophecies that I'd studied for over 20 years in the ministry came charging to the forefront of my mind because we were suddenly living in the last days. This was, let this be a warning. Watch the fig tree. One move in the right place, one bomb in the right location, one battle at the right time will unfold an avalanche of biblical revelation. You don't know how close we are. Back in the early 90s, I was watching the morning news with my mom, and she said to me, I never dreamed that I would see the day when there would be fighting in Bethlehem. It's a far cry from the Christmas hymn, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. All of our lives we've heard that Jesus is coming soon, and even though he's not yet returned, it's closer now than it's ever been. If we look close enough, we can see it. If we listen close enough, we can hear it. If we tune our spirit to God, we can feel it. We need to watch the fig tree. Throughout the Bible, we're constantly reminded to be prepared, to set our house in order, to expectantly await the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye, when God the Father gives the command, Jesus will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And he will split the eastern sky to reclaim the earth as his own. He will come to receive those who are his and to judge those who are not. Ever since I can remember, I've heard preachers preach about it and teachers teach about it and evangelists warning that it will soon come. And yet, we're not ready. Many believe that there's no need because they're convinced that life will continue on as always and there's no need to be alarmed. But they're missing the very subtle signs that inform us that it won't be long. You remember the movie Bruce Almighty with Jim Carrey? Throughout his frustrations in the movie, he admonished God for not being there when he needed him and not caring about the things happening in his life. But when he was frustrated and he doubted the most, there was an old man standing there with a sign, a message that Bruce always seemed to miss. A few years ago, the greatest natural disaster in the United States history rocked our country, Hurricane Katrina. The devastation covered over 90,000 square miles and directly affected the lives of over 1 million people. Thousands of people died, thousands were lost, their homes and were displaced around the country. Businesses were lost, towns were destroyed, families were separated in a very horrific series of events. People were in a panic, our nation was in shock, and there was confusion and sorrow and anger and a whole lot of finger pointing. Everybody wanted to place blame. It had to be somebody's fault and someone had to be responsible. After a tragedy, we find it very easy to be a critic, to place the blame and to make excuses. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, but sometimes we miss seeing the forest because of all of the trees that are in our way. The real culprit was the hurricane. Nobody caused the hurricane. Nobody ordered it or told it where to go, but it came from a tropical storm that played off of the winds and the currents, atmospheric pressures and the temperatures that spun it into a monster and then designed its path. No one could stop its advance because it was a storm. Meteorologists watched it being formed for days in advance. Day after day, they upgraded on the scale and projected its path, but very few people seemed to take them seriously. I want to give you the order of the warning. The Weather Channel updated the entire nation for days in advance. We all knew that it was coming. Even those of us in northwest Ohio who weren't going to be in danger knew that it was coming. That's why I found a particular, uh, a peculiar that the, the Mississippi governor, uh, Haley Barber, stated that the Hurricane Katrina, and I quote, caught him by surprise. <laughs> Thursday of that week, August the 25th, Hurricane Katrina turned on a path toward the mainland. On Friday the 26th, the federal government informed the area to evacuate, but the governors and the mayors didn't, did not issue the call. Evacuation takes 72 hours, but they didn't issue the call. On Saturday the 27th, New Orleans May, Mayor Nagan announces that the federal government has called for an evacuation, but no evacuation order was issued by the city. On Sunday the 28th, 14 hours prior to Katrina striking land, the city council president notes that the Lake Pontchartrain is rising and eating away at its, at its levee. 
He immediately goes to the hurricane war room and announces that the water was coming into the city. Sunday, 12 hours prior to Katrina striking land, New Orleans Mayor Nagin calls for a voluntary evacuation of the city. Remember, it takes 72 hours to evacuate. Sunday evening, Katrina strikes land, hitting New Orleans. The city is seriously damaged, but it survives. And then on Monday evening, the 29th, the levees break and the city's flooded. Then there is panic. People are one out, but the exit routes are clogged and completely gone. And then there's disaster. It's every man for himself, looting, pillaging, murder, and the whole nine yards. You see, it didn't just happen. This great storm didn't just take people by surprise. They didn't watch, uh, they didn't watch the 11 o'clock news uh, Go to, go to bed and then wake up in the middle of the night to a disaster. And so it will be with the return of Christ. We have had ample warning. We've heard the news. We've seen the signs. We've had plenty of time to repair and to save the people that we love. But still many people will be caught off guard and want to place blame on anyone but themselves. There were names bandied about and given blame for the disaster. Some blamed President Bush. I was really curious to how this other one was going to work out that we just had. See, some people thought that the president should have known about the disaster before it took place and prevented it. Now, presidents do have power, but I'm pretty sure they can't control the weather. Others thought he should have invoked invoked the Insurrection Act, which allows the president in times of unrest to command active duty forces to enter states and perform law enforcement duties. I want to ask you, what would have happened if a Republican president seized control of a state from a female Democratic governor? Rapper Kanye West and Senator Howard Dean blamed President Bush for the disproportionate number of black victims over Caucasian victims. Funny, I haven't heard anything out of either one of them since Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast. Some blame FEMA Chief Michael Brown. Brown's job is national emergencies. What many people don't know is that he had been fired from his last job. And that was overseeing a horse show. (laughs) He didn't have any disaster experience. He was critiqued for not acting soon enough. The city flooded Monday night. Nothing could move. On Tuesday, FEMA went in to clear the areas to deploy from their helicopters, trucks, and buses, and food and water. You can't drop pallets of food and supplies on people's heads. On Wednesday, equipment was brought in, and on Thursday, they were able to enter the city. Some blamed the governor, Kathleen Blanco. I honestly believe that she got hit with something that she wasn't prepared for, and in all fairness, something that no governor has ever been prepared for. However, she did ignore the evacuation call from the federal government on the previous Friday. Some blamed Mayor Nagin. Mayor Nagin also ignored the Friday evacuation call, refused to issue one on Saturday, and then on Sunday issued a voluntary order. He did ask for Greyhound buses to come pick up his citizens, and while he waited, floodwaters buried school buses that were already in New Orleans... The obvious means of escape weren't used. Some blame the city council president, Oliver Thomas. I believe that Mr. Thomas is the only person in this mix who deserves a real pat on the back. He did his job, but nobody paid attention to what he had to say. Some blame the citizens. Common sense tells you that you can't lump all the citizens together in this tragedy because they weren't all alike. There were the diligent that left the city before the disaster. There was the negligent that paid no attention to the warnings but continued to live life as always. They said it would just write it out. There was the criminal who stayed behind on purpose to loot and, 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 and greedily get all that they could, and many of them died with their treasure in their hands. Then there was the neglected, 10,000 people, 1% to 2% of the population. Some were too old, some were too young, some were too sick, and some were too ignorant to help themselves and were totally, totally dependent on other people to get them to safety. Now, I told you all that so I could, so I could relate to you this. Each of the players in Katrina disaster are relative to key people in our lives. People who we're going to blame, and maybe rightfully so, when the calamity of Christ's return catches us unprepared. Some people will try to blame God. It's always God's fault. After all, he's in ultimate control, and he could have saved us if he wanted to. Some will blame the professional ministry. There are those who write the books and hold the seminars, and who many will blame for not educating them enough to be ready. Some will blame their pastor. Not all pastors are prepared or even qualified to get their congregations ready for the return of the Lord. Some aren't doing the job and many will perish. Some blame the man of the house. Men have said it before and I'll say it again. God is going to hold you accountable for those under your responsibility. 
You're the one who's to make certain that your house is saved. And you've not used your obvious means of escape. Some will blame the woman of the house. Many wives spend countless hours praying for their household, urging their husband to get into church, start serving God, but often nobody seems to listen. But the real responsibility falls upon the individual. And just like in the hurricane, there are the diligent who are ready for Christ's return. There are the negligent who believe that they will get saved someday, and even if they don't, they're going to take their chances and ride it out. There are the criminal who have no spiritual insight and will be judged in the midst of their evil deeds. But then there's the neglected, our children who we lead away from God and his word, who will not make it because mom and dad didn't do their job. But there's one key player in the story that nobody considers, and that's the architect. Have you ever wondered why anyone in the right mind would march out into the middle of the ocean, build a bowl, pump out all of the water, and erect a city? In Matthew chapter 7, the Bible says that the wise man chose to build his house upon the rock, a firm foundation perched above the floodplain so that when judgment came, he and his household would be saved. However, it says the foolish man built his house upon the sand. It was a beautiful location near the water and easy to access, but when the floods came and the winds blew, his house was destroyed and great was the destruction of it. You are the architect of your house. Upon what you choose to build is your choice. The weather warnings have been issued. We've been tracking the return of Christ for 2,000 years now. The signs are being displayed. We know what route he's coming on. If the trumpet blows and you're not ready, you can blame God and you can blame professional ministry. You can blame the pastor. But the fact of the matter is, it's all up to you. It's all up to you. Watch the fig tree. Watch fig tree. Father, I just pray tonight that we'll get a sense of urgency about us. Lord, a lot of times I feel like the church just isn't prepared for the return of Christ. It's like we, we don't believe that it's going to happen because we're not committed to your work. We're not committed to ministry. We're committed to ourselves and our own agendas and our own little kingdom and our own programs. But God, as we watch what's unfolding around us, and God, we relate it to what you have explained to us in the scriptures, it's very easy to see that Jesus is coming real, real soon. God, we are the architect of our own household. Might that household be founded on Christ. Lord, might we be ready for your return. And not only that, but God might we reach out to others who are not ready and help them to be ready also. In Christ's name. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God or to receive a copy of Reverend James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103 or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.